friends so today i'm going to make a short video lecture on the topic of accelerators so it's a part of paper one of your bsc part three so i hope it has been discussed in the class but i once again want to walk you through this topic of accelerators so a very good day to you all so let's move on so as you know the name accelerators itself suggests that it is a device that accelerates the particles so maybe charged particles and sometimes in some sophisticated instruments they may also count to rays electromagnetic rays so starting with a linear accelerator which is also called as the drift tube accelerator so there are totally two types of accelerators for your syllabus one is the linear accelerator and the other one is a cyclotron so linear accelerator so it is a linear device cyclotron is a circular device so first let us start with linear accelerator so the principle charged particles can be accelerated by allowing them to fall through a suitable potential difference so that is the principle a brief principle so if you look at the diagram it is a schematic diagram so you can observe here this is the ionic source and these are the drift tubes that's why it is also called as drift tube accelerator so the length of the drift tubes it goes on increasing as you proceed further so it works mainly in this gap region between two drift tubes because this is where the particles get accelerated okay so these are the cylindrical electrodes and the polarity of these electrodes will always be alternating you can observe here if this is minus this is plus next this is minus this will be plus similarly if you observe here if this is plus this is minus this is plus this is minus okay so this is the direction in which the particles get accelerated now this arrow mark indicates the direction of the electric field because in order for the particles to get accelerated there has to be some electric field so this electric field offers the force for the charged particles in fact it accelerates the particles so f is equal to m into a so if the particles have to be accelerated then there is a need of force that force is provided by this electric field okay so suppose now listen carefully suppose i want to produce a positive charge here so in this ionic source i will produce a positive charge or a positive ion and i will let it pass through the first drift tube now when it enters the drift tube its polarity is a negative now as soon as the particle reaches this edge of the drift tube this right edge of the first drift tube the polarity suddenly changes as you can observe in the second diagram so suddenly the negative polarity becomes positive polarity and you can see here this is negative earlier it was positive now it is negative so when polarity changes the charged particle that is positively charged particle will get attracted towards this negative polarity electrode so in this gap it gets quickly accelerated now as soon as it comes here as soon as it comes here once again it moves inside the drift tube that is second drift tube with constant velocity there will be no kind of any no change of any kind inside the electrode so it only gets accelerated in this part and as soon as it enters the second electrode there will be no acceleration it just moves with constant velocity now remember 
its polarity is negative now as soon as the particle reaches this part this part so once again this negative polarity becomes positive so now this third electrode is negatively polarized so once again the charged particle gets attracted towards the negatively charged or uh, the electrode with negative polarity so it gets quickly accelerated once again in this gap once again after entering this cylindrical electrode with the negative polarity it once again moves with constant velocity there will be no acceleration inside the cylindrical electrode once again when it comes here the polarity of the uh, cylindrical electrodes change and now this becomes a negative this becomes positive as you can see here once again the charged particle gets accelerated in this gap and so its velocity increases and once again it reaches this electrode and again it moves with constant velocity inside this electrode okay. i hope it's clear so it all depends on the continuous change of polarities polarities of these electrodes because these are connected to an oscillator here so this does the work of changing the polarities of the cylindrical electrodes so if it is positive this will be negative if this is positive this will be negative when this becomes positive again this becomes negative so the polarities are continuously alternating so it is all controlled by this oscillator and it is so very intricately designed the moment of the charged particle should be synchronized with the oscillations produced by this oscillator see here as soon as it starts its journey here the charged particle will pass through this region okay so it passes along the straight line when it comes here immediately polarity changes it is oscillating continuously immediately polarity changes once again from here till here uh, uh, the oscillation uh, will continue and once again here at this point the charged particle will experience or it will witness a change in the polarities so from here to here it is half oscillation once again from here to here it is one more half oscillation from here to here once again it is one more half oscillation so in this way the oscillations continue so this is the working of the linear accelerator which i just explained so you can pause the video and write down the working if you are interested so you can observe in the last line here the total energy acquired in each gap the total energy acquired in each gap is q v naught electron volt q v naught electron volt so let us go to the theory of this so if there are n such gaps remember in each gap it gets accelerated every time it gets accelerated its velocity goes on increasing so if its velocity is 1 meter per second say in the first gap it gets accelerated by 2 meter per second so its velocity will be 3 meter per second once again in the second gap if it gets an acceleration of 4 meter per second so once again the 3 meter per second velocity increases okay so in acceleration is nothing but a rate of change of velocity so continuously in each and every gap its velocity goes on increasing but inside the cylindrical electrodes the velocities remain constant constant in the sense uh, increasingly constant so if inside the first cylindrical electrode if it is 1 meter per second constant in the second electrode it may be 3 meter per second constant in the third electrode it may be 7 meter per second constant in this way 
it goes on in the increasing order so if there are n such gaps then energy acquired in e uh, in n gaps is n q v naught q v naught is the energy acquired in one gap so total energy acquired in n gaps is n q v naught the total kinetic energy acquired so the final velocity so vn represents the final velocity in the sense it is the velocity in the nth cylindrical electrode okay so it is kinetic energy is half m vn square so equating these two energies remember the only energy possessed by the charged particle is kinetic energy so there is no potential energy it is just the kinetic energy so we can equate this to this energy so half m v n square is equal to n q v naught if you rearrange it you will get v n is equal to square root of 2 n q v naught divided by m so in these calculations the assumption is that v n is very much less than c remember v n is the velocity inside the nth cylindrical electrode and it is very much less than the velocity of light so it is not very huge so it is considerably less than the velocity of light so equation 2 shows that in order to get a high frequency energy beam the peak voltage that is v naught so it is the peak voltage of the oscillator v naught remember that it should be higher and the number of gaps n should be as large as possible so if you want to get high kinetic energy the output kinetic energy if you need it to be very high then definitely either you should increase n that is the number of gaps or you should increase the peak voltage of the oscillator so kinetic energy of the charged particles accelerated particles is directly proportional to n and v naught so if f is the frequency of the oscillating potential the time duration of half cycle is 1 by f remember time period is given by reciprocal of frequency 1 by f so time duration of half cycle is 1 by 2f so the time ions take in passing through a nth cylinder whose length is ln it is given by ln divided by vn so it is the simple formula velocity is equal to displacement by time so time is equal to displacement by velocity so ln represents displacement vn represents velocity ln is nothing but length of the nth cylinder so inside the cylinder it traverses a distance of ln hence it can be considered the length itself can be considered as displacement now vn is the velocity of the ions or the charged particles in the nth cylinder so for synchronization now for synchronization these two times should match so ln by vn is equal to 1 by 2f or ln is equal to vn by 2f so this is the final equation that is ln is equal to 1 by 2f square root of 2n q v naught divided by m so we have just replaced the value of vn with this value okay so this is the final expression for the length of the cylinder using this final expression we can obtain the cylindrical electrodes of the desired length suitable for our experiment so when i said these two times should match i need to go back here So as I told from here to here it is half oscillation okay so in the same time when the charged particle moves from this point to this point exactly when it comes here the oscillator should oscillate and change the polarity so exactly when it comes here this cylinder should become negatively polarized that's why it is very necessary that 
the time required for the traveling of the charged particle and the time required for half oscillation they should be in complete synchronization otherwise the charged particles may not get accelerated or sometimes even it may result in deceleration decreasing the velocity and hence decreasing the energy once again when it comes from here to here again it should change the polarities of the electrodes so from here to here it is half cycle once again from here to here it is half cycle so why there is an increase in the length of the cylinders successively it's because every time the charged particle passes through the gaps through the gaps their velocity goes on increasing when their velocity goes on increasing they travel a larger space or a larger length in space or a larger displacement is achieved in the same interval of time if it travels 2 meters in one second here it may travel 4 meters in the same one second here it may travel 6 meters in the same one second here so for the same time duration the displacement of the charged particle goes on increasing as its velocity increases as it accelerates hence there is an increase in the length of the cylinders successively so this is a short animation of what happens so please watch it so this is what happens inside a linear accelerator so the increase in the length of that uh, red object it indicates the increase in velocity every time it passes the gaps so please don't get confused the red color indicates a charged particle and the increase in the red color length it indicates the increase in velocity every time it passes through the gaps so ultimately when it passes through the final cylindrical electrode a very high energetic particle is obtained outside so some of the advantages so requirement of generating very high voltages is avoided in these accelerators so there is no need to get some million volts range voltages you can just operate them at thousand voltages okay so the range is in thousands not in millions so they are economical for obtaining very high energy particle beams so you can uh, obtain high energy particle beams at a low cost so that is one of the advantage they provide well collimated beam of accelerated ions that's because the charged particles are made to travel on a single axis single common axis for all the cylindrical electrodes hence you will definitely get a very well collimated beam so next limitations they are inconveniently long in size so this is one of the major drawback of linear accelerators so some of the working linear accelerators in this world uh, they are even so large that their length exceeds 3 kilometers so such huge linear accelerators are operating currently in this world so that is one of the major drawback they are very very extremely long in size and secondly they require extremely high frequency oscillators since the particles are moving at very high speeds relatively very high speeds uh, the oscillator needs to keep oscillating at a very high frequency the polarities need to change very very quickly okay so in a very short interval of time the polarities should keep on changing hence extreme high frequency oscillators are required so uh, that's something you need to know as part of your syllabus so that's all about linear accelerators so let's move on to magnetic resonance accelerators second part they are also called as cyclotrons 
so cyclotron once again it is a very similar device the only thing is uh, it is not linear it is circular so look at the principle a positively charged particle can be accelerated to high energy with the help of an oscillating electric field by making the particle to cross the same electric field time and again with the use of a strong magnetic field in the previous case we just had an electric field but here there are two fields one is the electric field and the other one is the magnetic field so you can observe here these are the electromagnets which produce magnetic field a perpendicular magnetic field okay and these uh, this circular part in the middle it is called as d's so there are two d's they are called as d's because they are in the shape of alphabet d capital d hence they are called as d's so this one is d1 this one is d2 once again these two d's are connected to the radio frequency oscillator which once again keeps changing the polarities of the two d's so it works very similar to re linear accelerators the only thing is here there are only two d's in linear accelerators there are many cylindrical electrodes one after the other but here the charged particle just gets circulated uh, in these two d's after uh, circulating in these two d's ultimately when it acquires very high energy it is brought out of these d's from this part and it is made to fall on the target so how it works here so remember there is a vertical magnetic field and a horizontal electric field and this electric field is present only between these two d's there is a small gap between these two d's and in that small gap the electric field will be present and the particles get accelerated only in that gap inside the d's once again they move with constant speed there is no change in the speed inside the d's they will only get accelerated each time they cross the gap between these two d's so now this is the source yes represents source it is exactly in the middle here so when the source produces a positively charged particle let us assume a positively charged particle and let us suppose that d1 is positively charged is at positive polarity and d2 is at negative polarity so when the source produces a positively charged particle it gets quickly accelerated towards d2 which is at a negative polarity so inside when it gets inside d2 because of this vertical perpendicular magnetic field it begins to move in a circular fashion so it just covers a semicircle once again when it mm, uh, reaches the gap between these two d's suddenly d2 becomes positive d1 becomes a negative so once again it moves from d2 towards d1 while moving from d2 towards d1 it gets accelerated so once again there is an increase in the velocity of the charged particle inside again it moves in a semicircular fashion with constant speed again when it comes in between the two d's once again the polarities get changed d1 becomes positive d2 becomes negative once again it gets accelerated in this gap between the two d's when it enters d2 again it moves with constant speed again it gets accelerated between the gaps again moves with constant speed inside d1 so this process goes on and goes on and goes on until it becomes a highly energetic particle when it reaches the outermost circular orbit so when it becomes a highly energetic particle there is something called as deflector plate here it is called as a deflector plate so this deflector plate will help in bringing this charged particle out of the cyclotron and the charged particle is made to fall on the desired target substance so this is a simple working of cyclotron 
so it has been explained here so if you want to write down the experiment or the working of the cyclotron you can pause the video and write down so let's move on to the theory let m be the mass of the positive ions to be accelerated and q be the charge on the ion the ion moves in a semicircle of radius r with velocity v in a perpendicular magnetic field b now magnetic force acting on the ion is equal to q into v into b it is actually q v b sin theta here theta is 90 degree because the direction between the velocity or the speed of the charged particle and the magnetic field it is 90 degrees as i told the charged particle is moving in a horizontal plane whereas the magnetic field will be in a perpendicular plane so sine theta that is sine 90 is 1 hence the formula is qvb so qvb is the magnetic force experienced by the charged particle remember the charged particle is moving in a circular fashion and in every circular path the object experiences a centripetal force so centripetal force in this case is nothing but the magnetic force so this centripetal force is equated to the magnetic force remember even though the magnetic field is in vertical direction the force produced on the particle by the magnetic field is in the horizontal plane so mv square by r is equated to qvb centripetal force is equal to magnetic force so you will get r is equal to mv by qv by just rearranging this equation so if m q and b remain constant because they are constants mass charge and uh, magnetic field intensity they are constants so r is directly proportional to v so as positive ions gain energy as that is as v increases the ions move in a semicircle of larger and larger radius so every time the particle crosses the gap every time the particle crosses the gap its velocity goes on increasing right so every time its velocity increases its radius also goes on increasing as its velocity increases its radius also goes on increasing so each time it crosses the gap it begins to move in a circular orbit of larger radius okay therefore the path of the ions is spiral in that is if t is the time taken by the ions to complete a semicircular path then t is equal to half 2 pi by omega now once again you can see here it is the simple formula velocity is equal to displacement by time so time is equal to displacement by velocity in this case we consider angular displacement by angular velocity for one complete circle the angular displacement is 2 pi that is 360 degrees so it is 2 pi here and angular velocity is represented by omega so it is 2 pi by omega for one complete circular path it is 2 pi by omega so for semicircular path it is half of 2 pi by omega so which gets equated to pi by omega 2 and 2 get cancelled so it is pi by omega so omega is the angular frequency which we can also call as angular velocity so omega is equal to v by r so this is a simple formula v is equal to r omega or omega is equal to v by r relation between linear velocity and angular velocity so therefore t is equal to pi r by v so here t is equal to pi by omega so in place of omega we are just inserting v by r so here it becomes t is equal to pi r divided by v so substituting the value of r from equation 1 which was in the previous screen we get t is equal to m v pi m by b q so this is equation 1 r is equal to m v by q v just put it here you will get pi m by b q so time t to complete a full circular path which is equal to 2t small t represents the time for semicircular path capital t represents the time for complete circular path so 
capital T is equal to 2 times of this so 2 pi m by b q so finally frequency is equal to 1 by t reciprocal of time period so if you just inverse it you will get b q by 2 pi m that is the frequency of the cyclotron so it is called a cyclotron frequency or cyclotron resonance frequency so it is nothing but the frequency of the radio frequency oscillator which is connected to the cyclotron so it can be obtained using this formula b q divided by 2 pi m b is the magnetic field intensity q is the charge of the particle and m is the mass of the charged particle so if r is equal to r max that is the radius of the last outermost orbit when the charged particle is about to come out of the cyclotron through the deflector plate the radius can be considered as r max so in that case r is equal to m v max divided by q b it is nothing from uh, nothing new but taken from equation one so in place of small r we have put capital r so mass into maximum velocity because in the last most orbit its velocity will be maximum so m v max by q b or v max is equal to b q r by m so correspondingly maximum kinetic energy can be written as half m v max square now just insert the value of v max from equation 4 so we will get e max is equal to half m b square q square r square by m square so here 1 m and 1 m get cancelled so we will get half b square q square r square by m so from equation 5 it is very clear that this maximum kinetic energy that is incorporated into the particle when it moves inside the cyclotron this maximum kinetic energy it mainly depends upon capital B and capital R so capital B in the sense magnetic field intensity so if you want a very high energetic particle out of the cyclotron you must increase B you must increase B also you can do it by increasing R that is increase the size of the T's increase the size of the D's as well as the size of the magnetic poles so if you increase the size of the D's you will get more opportunity to make the charged particle go in a circular path inside the D's as it goes on and on every time it completes a circular path every time it passes through the gap between the D's its energy goes on increasing so you can do it in two ways either by increasing b or by increasing r but one precaution here increasing b beyond a certain limit is not possible as most of the material saturate at a particular magnetic field so some uh, most of the electromagnets uh, they will be having a limit so you cannot just go on increasing the magnetic fields as per your wish so there is a limit so beyond that limit you cannot get any more acceleration achieved in the particles so uh, these are the two ways in which we can enhance the energies of the particles so this is short animated video so please watch it so that charged particle is produced by the source so look at the uh, change in the polarizations of the D's every time the charged particle reaches the gap the polarities keep changing so this is the deflector plate from here it is brought out onto the target So these are the metal chambers as I told they are called as D's because they are D shaped hence they are called as D's D1 and D2 so this is the source these are the poles of the electromagnet north pole and south pole they are con the D's are connected to a high frequency oscillator okay 
So lastly moving on to advantages. So cyclotron is much smaller in size compared to a linear accelerator very much. So linear accelerators require a very very huge space as I said earlier they may extend even up to 3 kilometers. But cyclotron can be uh, set up in a very very small space okay so they do not they are not huge instruments like the linear accelerators so that's one of the best advantage so no high voltages are required so as you can see here they can operate at kilo voltage range okay so linear accelerators require thousand voltage ranges but these require just kilo voltage ranges so these are two advantages main two advantages of cyclotrons if you look at the limitations uh, it has been estimated that the cost of building larger cyclotron scales roughly as a cube of the energy now this is one of the major drawback so uh, as the requirement of energy goes on increasing the cost of the cyclotrons also goes on increasing so it increases as the cube of the energy okay so if you want uh, if you want 5 units of energy its cost increases by 5 cube that is 5 cube is 125 so if you want to uh, create a cyclotron that generates 5 units of energy you have to pay the cost 125 times more okay than the normal cost so that's how it goes so the cost of 500 mega electron uh, Old cyclotron is about 10 raised to 8 US dollars. So 10 raised to 8 is uh, roughly uh, 1 US dollar, its approximate equivalent is 80 rupees. So if you just multiply 80 with 10 raised to 8, you will get around 800 crores. So just to set up one cyclotron, you have to spend 800 crores. So that's a very very huge amount so most of the countries cannot afford it depending on their economic conditions so that is the first limitation secondly as the energy of the ions increases relative heuristic effects come into the picture so here what happens is uh, the mass of the ions increases according to Einstein's theory of relativity according to Einstein's theory of relativity as the velocity of an object goes on increasing its mass also correspondingly goes on increasing so if you accelerate the particles to extremely high mass uh, high velocities then there is a possibility that their masses will also increase that is the particles go on becoming heavier and heavier so this causes the ions to go out of phase with the applied AC oscillations so the requirement is that the polarities should change exactly when the particle appears at the gap appears at the gap between that is but what happens when mass increases is that if the mass increases then they may not reach the gap exactly in the restricted time so they should reach the gap exactly when the polarities should change but when their mass increases there is a possibility that they may not reach the gap in time because they go out of phase so when that happens instead of accelerating the particles may start to decelerate their velocity may uh, begin to decrease instead of increasing so that is one of the major problem that may occur while doing the experiment okay so that is one of the limitations we cannot make the particles get accelerated to extremely high velocities so there is a limit to that so thirdly cyclotron cannot be used to accelerate electrons this is because electrons are much lighter compared to protons protons are positively charged electrons are negatively charged so protons mass and electrons mass there is an approximate difference of 10,000 units so if the mass of proton is 10,000 kg mass of the electron is just 1 kg so that's how much difference there is so because of this very less mass the problem that appears is when we accelerate the electrons they get quickly accelerated to extremely high velocities extremely high velocities so then uh, 
uh, this problem appears this one they may go out of phase they may go out of phase so because of their less mass less mass of the electrons they may quickly get accelerated to high velocities and they will go out of phase so there is no possibility of getting a very high energetic particle or high energetic electron out of the cyclotron hence cyclotrons are not suitable for accelerating electrons but we can easily accelerate positively charged particles remember we cannot accelerate neutrons using this technique we can only accelerate charged particles that is positive or negatively charged particle in linear accelerators which are also called as a linux we can easily accelerate positive as well as negatively charged particles but in cyclotrons we can only accelerate positively charged particles so uh, these two types of accelerators these are mainly used in many medical applications for the treatments of cancers so you can uh, using these instruments you can get a high energetic beam of particles that can be directed to the cancerous part inside the body and destroy the cancerous part so in many ways these accelerators are used in medical applications as well and also in many other uh, purposes industrial purposes so scientific purposes so you, you may be knowing about uh, CERN European agency CERN so there is a huge uh, accelerator particle accelerator in Geneva okay so it is a very big accelerator so uh, it is on the border of two countries actually so it is one of the largest particle accelerators that is set up by CERN okay so you can get more information on that uh, on internet so you can google it and obtain information but since it is not part of the syllabus i'm not going to discuss it here so i'm going to end it here hope the things are pretty clear so if you have any doubts you can post it in the comment section so uh, i hope to see you all again in the classrooms so i was happy to meet you all through this online video once again so please be ready for your exams and study well and thank you very much for joining me bye bye